from New Hampshire Public Radio. I'm Laura Kanoy, and this is The Exchange. New Hampshire Democrats have a choice in the governor's race this fall. Two candidates are running for their party's gubernatorial nomination, Steve Marchand and our guest today, Molly Kelly. We spoke with Marchand earlier this year in March. Today we sit down with Kelly. She's a former five-term state senator from the Keene area. She stepped aside from state politics in 2016, but at the time said, I am not closing any doors to future political involvement. Now Kelly's ready to jump back in with a campaign slogan of building a New Hampshire that works for everyone. Today in the exchange, we ask what that means, and let's hear from you. Our email is exchange at nhpr.org. Again, exchange at nhpr.org. Respond on Facebook or Twitter at NHPR Exchange or call in 1 800 892 6477. And you can also watch our interview today on Facebook Live. And Senator Kelly, uh, welcome back to the exchange. Thank you. Thank you for having me here this morning. Well, in an interview with NHPR's Peter Biello recently, you said you're getting back into politics, back into this race, because you don't like, to quote you, the direction our state is going. What specifically, Senator Kelly, is it that you don't like? Because some people would look in New Hampshire and say, hey, pretty high median income, low taxes, low unemployment. Nothing's perfect, but New Hampshire in general ranks pretty well. Well, Laura, I'll tell you what happened for me. As you mentioned, I was in the Senate from 2006 to 2016, and we had an election. And after that election, I know I share this with many, many people. We were very, very, I was very, very disappointed. And I I know that others uh, have been too, and and devastated by what what, uh, I saw and what I had worked for all that time in the Senate um, taking place, and in particular, looking and saying what uh, the policies that now were being implemented in the Trump administration were finding their way here to New Hampshire under our current governor, so a Chris Sununu. So couple examples, a couple specifics. Well, yes, and I, I think, uh, two, uh, education and the voucher program, uh, school voucher program, and the suppression of, of voter rights are just two of those. So, Laura, I think you mentioned this at the beginning uh, of what I want, you know, what I want for New Hampshire. And I do. I want a New Hampshire where everyone has a chance to succeed, not just a few. And I'm very concerned about that. Just to tell you briefly a little bit about where I came from, um, I'm from a very large family. I'm number two, actually, of 11 children and the oldest girl, which I think gives me some credibility there. Um, But uh, what I learned um, every day, Every evening when we were sitting around a dinner table, and there were 13 of us, that truly, if one of us was to succeed, we all needed to succeed. And that's what I believe I will do and the value I will take uh, that's important to me as governor. If, Laura, if one of us is to thrive, we must all thrive. And that's why I'm running for governor. Well, I want to ask you about a couple key points that you raised, including taxes, Mm -hmm. including the quality of life here in New Hampshire, including education. So let's get to all that, if we could, Senator Kelly. Um, First of all, what's your view on the so-called pledge that candidates for governor here in New Hampshire usually take, promising that if elected, they won't support any broad-based sales or income taxes? Are you taking the pledge, Senator Kelly? Laura, I have been very clear, very clear from day one uh, that I would veto a sales or income tax. And there's a solid subset of liberal Democrats, you're from the Keene area, so you know, that would just like their gubernatorial nominee to chuck the pledge. Um, You know, there's a good group of Democrats, um, you know, sometimes measured at 30 or 40 percent who say, forget the pledge. It's hurt our state more than it's helped. What's your message to those Democrats? Well, what I want to do is I want to strengthen public education. And I want to move our state forward so that, as I said, everyone has the opportunity. I want everyone to have an opportunity to an education, job training, skills training, um, because because I believe if we do have those opportunities, we are able to move forward and take care of our families. Education is personal to me. I will tell you from right now that um, just I'm going to tell you a little bit why that's personal to me. Today, I am married to a wonderful, wonderful husband, um, and we have four children now and seven grandchildren. But long before that, I was a single mother of three children, um, and I was working very hard to uh, attain and finish my education. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy as a single mother to do that. I managed apartments on the complex of the campus I lived with my children. 
I waitress one night a week. We even had a rural paper route in Peterborough, New Hampshire. That's a lot of driving. <laughs> On Saturday mornings, just Saturday mornings. But so I know what it's like to work hard. And all of the people that I see every day in New Hampshire work very, very hard. But what we all need is we need to know that that work gets us somewhere. And education and job training and skills training will do that. So so when you talk about education um, and where we need to go, what really disappoints me is that our governor supported an education voucher program. Well, and that did get shot down ultimately in the legislature. So getting back did, to the question about, you know, some Democrats, we hear from them often. Um, people email and call on the show and say, you know, forget the pledge. It's hurting our state. You're talking about education. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have the pledge, would our schools have more money um, because they wouldn't be tied to this property tax-based system of, um, of funding. Well, what, what I would tell you is that um, the governor said that if he is reelected, Chris Sununu, he would make the education voucher bill a priority. That weakens public education, and it increases our property taxes, which is what citizens in New Hampshire are most concerned about. So I would veto that bill immediately. So there are things that we can do to strengthen education. Um, the governor has also um, provided tax breaks to the 3% of the wealthiest corporations uh, here in New Hampshire, $100 million. That $100 million, we can use that to fund education. So if we, you were elected, would you roll back the yes, tax cuts that the Republicans yes, I would um, put in place? I would repeal those tax cuts. And there is revenue that then we shift and we put uh, towards public education, job training, uh, affordable college, and pay our teachers. Well, we definitely need to talk about college. But here's an email that came in on this idea of um, the pledge. Um, David from Summersworth says, I was very disappointed to hear that Molly Kelly took the oath NHPR just had a piece about how high the property costs are keeping young adults from moving to New Hampshire and forcing our youth to leave the state. David says the main reason for this is high property taxes because that's the only tax we have. This regressive tax is unacceptable, he says. It's a tool of the wealthy to push the burden of supporting our state onto lower and middle class workers. We need, David says, to implement an income tax so that the wealthiest among us pay their fair share. As I said, Senator Kelly, a, a subset of um, people in New Hampshire have long felt that our lack of an income tax is regressive and is hurting our state. So I just wonder what your no, message no, is to I, those I, I Democrats. I understand that, and I, and I hear that as well. What I want to do is to be able to move our state forward and to accomplish the things that I can do. And what I can do is to repeal the $100 million on uh, the tax breaks for the wealthiest corporations, which David is referring to. I agree there is a, a discrepancy and um, that we would be able to equalize that. Also, that would lower our property taxes because our schools are paid uh, by a lot of property taxes and also some state funding. And to his point um, on uh, uh, attracting young people, we need good public policy that does attract our young people to stay here. We know that they're leaving. When I talk to businesses, Laura, what I hear them say is what they're looking for is a prepared and a skilled workforce. Not one business has said to me, and I was in the Senate 10 years, I chaired a council that worked with uh, ed, uh, CEOs of manufacturing educators. Not one said to me, would you increase my taxes? So, so as governor, you would repeal these or roll back these business yes, tax yes. cuts. That's going to be a tough sell if you win the nomination. Republicans will say, hey, vote for Molly Kelly. She'll increase your taxes. No, I'm not an increase in taxes. I'm talking about the 3% of the wealthiest corporations here in our state, and that money does not come back into our state. I want to reinvest our dollars into New Hampshire, in particular public education, so that we are not increasing our property taxes. We can do that. And also young people, when I mentioned before, businesses are looking for a prepared workforce to move forward. Young people are leaving because they don't see the opportunities. We need government to impose and to create good public policy that is friendly to our young to our young students. If we do that, Laura, and we invest in them, whether it's K through 12 and, and co making college affordable, um, then we will continue to reinvest with our businesses. They'll be profitable. They'll be successful. And that um, profit and revenue comes back into the state in many, many 
ways, and we continue to reinvest it. What I was just say, Go what, ahead, sure. <laughs> what, what I hear from young people all the time is that they don't want just a job. They want a good job. They want a job where they feel like they can move forward with their family. They want to be a part of an economy that's innovative and creative, and they're leaving. So we need to be able to keep them here. I understand the expense of a college education. I know what it was like because I was there with my young children at that time. So we need to continue to reinvest in, in our young people. A voter suppression bill that the governor um, he signed one. He's looking at another, looking for a reason to uh, to sign that bill. That's the residency requirement. That, they they yes, wouldn't call that, it a voter suppression bill. But it is yeah. a voter suppression. It is a barrier That's, to voting. That's what it is. And it targets our college students. So if you are thinking of coming to New Hampshire or you're thinking about staying in New Hampshire – and you're a college student, that is not a welcoming public policy. I want to ask you about higher education because you've mentioned the high cost, and certainly that's a concern. The state's community colleges just announced a tuition hike. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, you know, our, our university system has among the highest in-state tuition costs in the country. In fact, it might be the highest at this point. It um, is. <laughs> and lots of young people go out of the state, even out of the country now, to save money on tuition. So as Governor how do you tackle this, um, Senator Kelly, um, especially if, you know, you put forward a budget that increases the payment to the university, university system and the legislature says, no, we're not going to give you that. I mean, what other sort of innovative ideas do you have? I about think there are lots this? of innovative ideas. Um, you know, we are moving forward in a world that has different expectations, uh, looking for innovation and skills. Um, we need to be a part of that movement to move forward and make sure that we hold on to those skills and those wonderful creativeness that our students have. So we need to incentivize them to be here, to, to go to school, go to college here, and to stay here. That's what's even more important. So this can only that? happen with public-private working together. So as I mentioned before in the industries, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's healthcare. Uh, because they're all looking um, for a, a prepared workforce. This moment in time is the opportunity for us to come together and work together to do that and not stay in separate silos, thinking it's just educators' responsibility here and then it's industry's responsibility here. And I see a lot of that innovation happening. And the reason I say it's a great opportunity is because we're both looking for the same thing. So how do you do it? Well, I think we can have internships. We can have incentives where you go to college in New Hampshire and you then are able to work in industries, whatever they are, to help pay back your student loans. When I talk to students, what they say to me is what's most important to them when they graduate from college is that they're working for a company that's meaningful, that that company is as invested in them as that, that graduate is invested so in that company. So some loan payback type loan program. Loan payback. How about affordable housing that's initiated by industries and health care so that students can start to pay back their student loans and be able to afford working here in New Hampshire, creating and embracing their careers, giving back to the state that, uh, that they do want to stay and live in but can't afford. Many students leave because they go home to live with their parents because they need to stay pay off their student loans. So here we have an opportunity in our state where industries are saying we need a prepared workforce, an educated and skilled workforce. And we have students saying, and I want to be a part of that, but I don't see the opportunities because of my student loans or I don't understand what those opportunities are in the industry. Internships. So you just need people need to talk to each other more. Those two no, segments create really create because internships real already happen. Mm, I mean, they don't as much as they could. And I also think that the private industries uh, can be as in, be involved on campuses of uh, bringing young, uh, bringing our students into their industries to see what's really going on. So a little bit more of that because I think some of that does happen, but already. much more of that. So you would facilitate that Ab as Absolutely. Governor. You know, Collaboration is really, I think, the answer to the future. And that's what I do. And that's what I do best. Here's an experiment that I heard about in another state. I think it was <laughs> New York State, but don't hold me to it. Noodling around with the idea of if, um, so if an in-state student goes to college in that state, the state will pay for their tuition if that student promises to live there for three years. That's there, an idea. There are many programs. Now, that like would be that. expensive, because then the state but, is paying that. But think that. about the investment you just made. So 
I think that investing in education is the wisest investment we can make. So would that with, be a good idea with for the New greatest Hampshire? with the greatest return for all? So that so you might have the um, initial investment, but just think about the return. Where what we have today is we have a governor who says, "I'm giving tax breaks to the three percent of the wealthiest corporations." A hundred million dollars. So, what investment works best for the people, for all the people of New Hampshire? So, is this an idea you could get behind, um, yes, Senator yes, Kelly, paying yes. the tuition can, for we, people who promise to stay here we, for we X can, number of we years? We can look at programs that help students pay off their college loans by being invested here in companies and industries and. Uh, in our state. We have to work together to do that, Laura. Let me remind our listeners that you can join us. We're sitting down with Democratic gubernatorial candidate Molly Kelly today. She's talking about her campaign, what she'd like to do if she's elected this fall. We spoke with Kelly's primary opponent, Steve Marchand, also a Democrat, back in March. You can listen to that interview on our website if you'd like. And you can watch us on Facebook Live today, too, as well as listening. You can join us now with your questions and comments, 1-800-892-6477. Send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org. Again, exchange at nhpr.org. Again, you can give us a call at one 800 892 Six four seven seven, and um, Senator Kelly, one more question on education, and then we should turn to many, many other issues, mm-hmm. including energy, uh, the opioid crisis, um, and so on and so forth. But on kindergarten, Governor Sununu was able to find a way to get full day kindergarten in those last remaining districts that didn't have it yet through the approval of the electronic gambling game Kino in bars and restaurants. And I wonder how you feel about so called Kino Garden. So. I support full-day kindergarten, no question. Always did in the Senate for 10 years and whatever we could do. I, just, I, I know that uh, what had passed, I think that we can do better than that. Uh, again, I'm going to go back to what are our priorities and where we spend the money. Do we give tax breaks of $100 million to 3% of the wealthiest corporations, or do we fund education. As governor, you have choices to make. So you're saying we didn't need to do Kino Garden? I don't think we need to go forward and to do that. No, I would disagree with uh, what I disagree with is that we've made choices to take money that could be used for for education, and we've given it to 3% of our wealthiest corporations, and we've left a gap. Well, Democrats had long tried to get full-day kindergarten statewide. It talked about it for a long time. The governor was able to find an alternative way. So maybe this is the New Hampshire way to do it. Well, I think we can do better. That's, I feel that way about that. I understand. I was in the Senate for 10 years. I understand that you have to sometimes take baby steps to make progress. And that's one we did get full-day kindergarten. But not every town, not every city is a green. So I think there's still disparity in our state. Does every child end up having access to full-day kindergarten? Well, they still, as I understand, even if a town or city doesn't approve Keno, they still get the money for full day. So people aren't punished. Communities aren't punished for that. No, but I think that we can do that in a more sustainable way than Kino. We will talk more with our listeners after a short break, so stay on the line. The number is 1-800-892-6477. Send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org. Respond on Facebook or Twitter if you'd like. It's NHPR Exchange. And more in a moment with Democratic gubernatorial candidate Molly Kelly. This is The Exchange on NHPR. This is NHPR 919. Good morning. NHPR has canceled the June Fun Drive to bring you more of the news you trust and the programs you love without interruption. But it's still essential that you support the service with a financial contribution today. It's easy to give at NHPR.org. And thanks. Support for NHPR comes from your listeners and from Advest in You, a local New Hampshire nonprofit specializing in college student loans and student refinancing options. Information online at nhstudentloans.org. And from the Barnstormers Theatre, Tamworth presenting Mel Brooks and Thomas Meehan's musical comedy, The Producers, June 28th to July 7th. Tickets at barnstormerstheatre.org. Nice day today, partly to mostly sunny. High temperatures in the 70s, clear tonight. Overnight lows, upper 40s to mid 50s. For tomorrow, sunny. Highs, upper 70s to lower 80s. Sunny Thursday, high temperatures in the 70s. This is NHPR.
This is The Exchange. I'm Laura Canoy. Today, Molly Kelly is here, a Democratic candidate for governor. We spoke with her primary opponent, Steve Marchand, back in March. That interview is on our website, nhpr.org slash exchange, and you can listen and watch our interview today on Facebook Live. Send us an email right now, exchange at nhpr.org. Again, exchange at nhpr.org. Respond on Facebook or Twitter at NHPR Exchange, or give us a call, one 800 Eight nine two six four seven seven, and um, Senator Kelly, let's go to our listeners. Lots of emails coming in. Here's one from Angie, who says other states that bring in more taxes to lower property taxes see those property taxes jump back up within ten years. We attract some businesses because they can pay people a slightly lower wage because there's no sales or income tax. Add those taxes, and those businesses lose their inclination to be in New Hampshire. I have no problem with the fact that I pay 3000 a month in property tax. I'd rather have that than income or sales taxes. There are people on the lake in my ta- town who pay 30000 plus in property tax. It's fair, Angie says. The wealthy are paying more. So there's Angie agreeing with your decision to take the pledge. We heard earlier from David who disagreed with that. Thank you for the email, Angie. Did you want to jump in real I, quick? I just want to just make a comment comment on that is these are the arguments we hear every day, and we've heard them for a long time. I just want to be clear as well that there is no one in this race running for governor uh, who has uh, uh, said that they would uh, support a sales or income tax. There is no one. Thanks, Angie, for the email. Here's another email. This is Fred in Canterbury. Would the candidate support a single-payer health care program for New Hampshire, whether it is a single-state, regional, or national plan? And Fred, thank you very much. I would support universal health care. Um, however, I will just say uh, that it is very difficult to do on a state basis. As Vermont found right, out. Right. So I would uh, certainly work with um, our delegation and with the federal government um, if we have the opportunity to do that. And I would support I would support universal. What I believe is that everyone has a right to, to uh, health care. And that's the premise. And I think universal health care would make that happen. I did support the Affordable Care Act. And I voted for Medicaid expansion um, every time I had an opportunity to do that in the Senate. Uh, but what has happened over time, and our current governor uh, supported uh, um, weakening the Affordable Care Act and, and agreed with uh, what was happening in Congress not to support the Affordable Care Act. So we really differ. Well, he supported on that. Medicaid expansion, actually. He, he supported Medicaid expansion, but early on did not support uh, the Affordable Care Act. And I'm saying from day one, I have. I think we have weakened the Affordable Care Act, and I would continue to uh, support Medicaid expansion um, and universal health care. Well, and again, you're sort of responding to Fred. Um, you know, single state, it's tough to do. Mm-hmm. National, that's more up to Congress. Mm-hmm. But he also says, what about a regional plan? And I have heard, um, Senator Kelly, some people talk about, look, it's hard to do as a single state nationally, Mm -hmm. our politics seem kind of stuck. So what about getting together with other New England states? Well, I believe that uh, we have a right to health care. So if there are uh, conversations and possibilities to work regionally to make that happen for the people of, of New Hampshire... I would certainly be open to that. Thank you for the email, Fred. Again, you can join us by phone, 1-800-892-6477, or email exchange at nhpr.org. Facebook or Twitter, it's NHPR Exchange. Senator Kelly, here's one from Marty, who says, what is your stand on Northern Pass? Thank you, Marty. Um, Laura, I have never supported Northern Pass. Why not? I haven't supported Northern Northern Pass because I feel it was really... uh, uh, imposed on the people of New Hampshire instead of working together with them. Also, tourism is a real economic engine in our state, and I am very concerned and what's concerned uh, that Northern Pass would have an effect on that, and I really want to continue to support that economic engine of tourism. So I did not support Northern Pass. doesn't mean I wouldn't support other ideas uh, that had to do with hydro uh, that would actually uh, enhance uh, energy resources in our state uh, uh, that did not have the same effect uh, on tourism or environment. Um, you know, I, uh, we need a diverse energy plan. In New well, let's talk about energy. And I'm glad you emailed Marty because I want to talk with you um, about energy anyway, Senator Kelly. Mm-hmm. As you know, Governor Sununu in May released his 10-year energy strategy for the state, addressing a huge complaint of New Hampshire businesses that their energy costs are way too high. 
Um, the new plan gives support for Seabrook Nuclear Energy Power Plant. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about keeping Seabrook open, Senator I, I Kelly? I think Seabrook is a reality today and that we need their energy to have electricity. However, I disagree with our governor on a 10-year energy plan. Uh, there's very little room in his uh, plan for renewable energy. I think that is more important to be able to continue to uh, address that issue. Um, and and I will tell you that in the Senate, one of the bills that was my primary primary bill that I sponsored and passed, <clears throat> excuse me, was the group net metering bill. And what that did was it did propel solar uh, energy, uh, and which provides clean uh, energy in into New Hampshire. It propelled that, and I'm proud of that. I think that we need to be looking more at renewable energy. Um, and right now, I will tell you that there are three bills uh, waiting for the governor's signature. And I'm not quite sure where he is going with them. I don't understand why they haven't passed. One is an expansion of the bill that I put in for group net metering to move it from one uh, megawatt to five so that we can enhance group uh, net metering, uh, which is, as I said, renewable energy with solar. There are many municipals, m- municipalities and also manufacturers who would like to implement and to, and to be able to use solar um, and to broaden it and to move it uh, in a much um, uh, larger from a one to a five. I- I'd like to see it go beyond a five, but you well, know this is where we are. And let me jump in if I could just, and correct me if I'm wrong, net metering would allow more, this was your goal, to allow more small scale solar producers to sell their power back to the grid. That's the idea. Well, it's really, yes. I mean, so at the bottom line, how it would work, would let's say you're a manufacturer and you have three different buildings on your property. The building that could actually hold the solar panels doesn't use much en- energy, but the building that actually uses a lot of energy, and is, uh, which is the cost for the manufacturer, you couldn't put a solar panel there. So you put solar panels on the building that can ho- house, and you um, then group your buildings together with your industry, your property, and you then produce energy from solar that goes to the grid and you're credited for any energy that you actually put back on the grid. So municipalities and schools think about what opportunities we have to do that. That bill to increase that and to provide those opportunities has not been signed, and I don't understand that. Um, We need to move forward. And I do understand that the governor's plan in the 10-year plan, is very weak on renewable energy. And, Laura, we must move forward. Well, the governor's energy strategy calls on the state to redefine renewable energy. It's RPS, uh, the Renewable Mm -hmm. Energy Portfolio, um, Mm -hmm. to include nuclear power or large-scale hydro from Quebec, arguing that if reducing emissions, I'm quoting here, if reducing emissions is a primary objective, then the RPS should be redefined to include other zero- or low-carbon resources. Again, Senator Kelly, your thoughts, should the state's renewable portfolio include nuclear and large-scale hydro? As I said before, I think Seabrook is here. We're, we need it. It's real. Um, I think we need to make Doesn't sure... Doesn't sound like you love it. I don't... It's probably not my favorite, um, but we can make it as safe as we possibly can. That would be a role of the governor, obviously. Um, but I, what I want is a vision to move forward with other renewables. But we have we have to be diverse in the state. We are. Um, uh, we rely on Seabrook. And as I mentioned, I would push more for renewable, whether it's in hydro or wind. We need to open those doors up. They can be. It is time, and we need to move forward. I will tell you that I believe that climate change is real. Now, I know that our governor was on your show um, here and said he's not so sure that he believes that climate change is real. So what I believe is that government should be making policies based on facts, and climate change is not a controversial fact. Well, speaking of government policy on energy, the governor's strategy also emphasizes market incentives, saying it's time for the state to, quote, get out of the business of picking winners and losers in the energy market. Do you agree, Senator Kelly? The government shouldn't pick winners and losers. I think government should work with uh, industry and uh, energy and utilities to make sure that we do move, move forward have renewable energy, a diversified, balanced energy uh, plan, which I would put forward, and um, to make sure that we reduce uh, and act 
and act and not wait to act to limit what is and reverse, I should say, reverse climate change. Well, again, Marty, thank you for the energy question, because it's a subject that Senator Kelly has worked on and that we needed to talk about. So thank you, Marty. You can send us an email to exchange at nhpr.org. Again, exchange at nhpr.org. Facebook or Twitter is NHPR Exchange, or give us a call, 1-800-892-6477. Here's a political question from Barbara, who says, it is clear that our legislature was redistricted to advantage to the advantage of one political party, what would you do to make the legislature fairly redistricted in 2020? Public commission, Barbara asks. Thank you, Barbara, for the email. Yeah, it, it is true. And people are really concerned about what happens uh, and what will happen in 2020. And we need a fair system to do that and to involve the public um, and look at how we can make changes to move forward so that it is fair and people have fair representation um, so that is, that is a, it's a possibility. interested in a yeah. public commission. Right. And just to let listeners right. know, right now in most states, the party in power mm-hmm. in the legislature mm-hmm. gets to redraw the lines. Some states are saying, whoa, when we're out of power, it's not, not as nice for us. So a public commission. And we have to be careful about who appoints the public commission because we don't want to go back and be in a vicious circle with this. But well, I do agree um, and I do hear from people often that we have to stop this cycle couple more political questions. Um, You're running against Steve Marchand, as I said. We talked to him earlier this year on March 10th, if people want to look up that interview. Why should Democrats, Senator Kelly, choose you over Mr. Marchand? Laura, I think my experience in the state Senate um, prepares me to be a very effective governor. I have a record of uh, solving problems, working across uh, uh, the aisle to get things done. And I think um, that uh, that speaks to uh, my preparation, as I said, for governor and distinguishes me from our current, uh, from, from my primary opponent. You know, I am proud of my Senate record. I have always stood up, as you know, for public education. I have been a champion for women's rights, and I will stand up for Planned Parenthood every single day. I am proud that I was one of the first senators to be able to vote for the Marriage Equality Act, which is really 10 years ago. And, you know, I uh, stood up for gun safety in our schools and in our communities when it wasn't even popular. So being progressive and being bold and fighting for these issues, Laura, it is not new to me. So... That seems to be a response to what Steve Marchand's supporters have said, is that he's the more progressive of the two, sort of mirror, mirror on the wall. (laughs) Who's the most progressive of all? And I will just say that I, as I told you from the very beginning um, of our conversation here this morning, that I am running against Chris Sununu because I am concerned that the policies that have been implemented under the Trump administration in Washington have found their way here to New Hampshire under our governor, Chris Sununu. And I'm not asking you to go negative on Steve Marchand. I think Mm -hmm. you guys see eye to eye on a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. But Democrats do need to make a choice. Mm -hmm. In September, they see Molly Kelly, they say Steve Marchand, they say, hmm, which way should I go? So I want to give you the opportunity to make your case that um, you're the better choice. You said it's your experience um, in the state legislature. Are there specific issues where you would take a different approach, um, Senator Kelly, than Mr. Marchand? Well, I think I think a lot of it is the approach to the issues and to um, how uh, how I have uh, handled those over so many years in the Senate and a lifetime. I will just say that uh, uh, everyone has the opportunity to hear from both of us. We are. We are often at the same place on the same day, and people can hear uh, hear from us. Uh, my priority has always been education. It was when I entered the Senate, and it will be uh, my uh, priority a- as governor as well. And the issues I mentioned to you before as a champion for women's rights, standing by Planned Parenthood, those are priorities for me, working, working and uh, fighting every day for children and for families is something I've done. Um, and so I think there are some of those experiences, the strength, the uh, length of time, uh, the building of uh, relationships across the state so that I can get things done. I have that experience. I will just add to this just one thing, Laura, is that when, when you're in the Senate and you're making decisions, they're not always easy. And you have to know who you are and what you believe in to make those right decisions. I've been tested. I've been there. 
I know what it's like to wake up during the night and to say, think to myself, how does my vote tomorrow morning affect the people I serve? That is a time that you really, as I said, know who you are, understand what public service is and who you serve and why you serve. And I think having been in that, what I might call the hot seat, um, and reckoning has prepared me to be a governor, to make some of the hardest decisions we will make. So it's the experience argument that you're using. It is really the experience. So it's my last question on this, because we will go back to our listeners. Um, You've sewn up most of the Democratic establishment, New Hampshire Teachers Union, former governor, now Senator Maggie Hassan. You've got the establishment taken care of. How do you reach out to that progressive wing of the party, Senator Kelly, which, as you know, went strongly for Bernie Sanders over the establishment Hillary Clinton two years ago? How do you I say I'm not to that? I will also add to that the Teamsters <laughs> also endorse. And I am proud of my endorsements. I had worked, I have worked uh, for a very long time with U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen. She has opened up many doors for people like myself um, and does an outstanding, incredible job. So I am honored uh, to have her endorsement as well as Senator Maggie Hassan, who I served in the state Senate with and served as she was governor. And also uh, the others that you all mentioned Congressman Annie Custer, uh, NEA. Um, uh, past and present state senators, they know me. So that's they know not a how I work. This year, it in this is sort of a, anti-establishment. Is a there is nothing wrong with experience, and there is nothing wrong with a record that you stand by that is very progressive. And they trust me, um, and uh, I am truly honored. Um, so I want to ask you about Governor Sununu. Um, Politically, you've talked a lot about the issues where you disagree, what you mm-hmm. would do differently. Um, that's to be expected. If you are the nominee, Senator Kelly, um, Governor Sununu will be a formidable opponent. He's strong in the polls, mm-hmm. and he's got that history behind him. Almost all New Hampshire governors, uh, except for Craig Benson in the last 80 or 90 years, have gotten a second term. So how do you beat the odds there? Well, Laura, I'm out talking with people every day, and they're very enthusiastic about uh, uh, a candidate who is running uh, – against uh, Chris Sununu uh, to win the governor's seat because what they're looking for is a governor who will work every day and work hard and fight for public education, um, who will protect uh, your right to vote, who will work hard every day to make sure that women have uh, uh, their rights over the reproductive health care. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a governor who will invest in job training and not give um, wealthiest corporations, tax breaks that are taking that away. I will also say that um, uh, Chris, Chris Sununu can underestimate me every day if he likes. I have been underestimated most of my life. I was under, uh, uh, people thought that it would be impossible for me to be able to go to college and, and to move forward with my life with three small children. Uh, when I ran for the state Senate, I ran against a Republican leader, and I won, Laura, and now I'm running for governor. Well, coming up, we will talk about marijuana legalization. Also, uh, we'll look at some of the happenings around the State Liquor Commission, and we'll take a lot more of your questions and comments. So feel free to join us, 1-800-892-6477. Send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org. More with Democratic gubernatorial candidate Molly Kelly in just a moment. This is The Exchange on NHPR. This is NHPR 939. Good morning. Why is the U.S. still in Afghanistan? A recent ceasefire saw some Taliban fighters and Afghan soldiers hugging and taking selfies. But the latest insurgency has left 70% of the country in the hands of the militants. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have served in Afghanistan. What do they think the U.S. should do now, if anything? Next time on 1A. That's this morning at 10 here on NHPR. Support for NHPR comes from you, our listeners, and from Nathan Wexler and Company, professionals working together as a team to provide businesses and nonprofits comprehensive accounting and tax solutions, offices in Keene, Concord, and Lebanon. 
M from the New Hampshire Association of Chamber of Commerce Executives with a reminder that business is a contact sport and chambers help businesses get in the game. NHACCE.com. This is NHPR. This is The Exchange. I'm Laura Kanoy. Tomorrow on our show, it's our earlier conversation on the high cost of summer for many Granite State families. That's tomorrow on The Exchange. This hour, Molly Kelly is here. She's a former state senator and now a Democratic candidate for governor. In addition to listening to our interview today, you can watch it on Facebook Live. We spoke to Senator Kelly's Democratic opponent, Steve Marchand, a few mar- months ago back in March. So you can go to our website and check that out as well. You can send us your questions for Senator Kelly right now at exchange at nhpr.org, exchange at nhpr.org. Respond on Facebook or Twitter at NHPR Exchange or give us a call 1-800-892-6477. And uh, Senator Kelly, lots of emails have been coming in. Let's go to the phones now. And Chris is calling in from Lyme. Hi, Chris. You're on the air. Welcome. Thank you. Go ahead, Chris. Um, I'm I'm concerned about affordable housing for uh, people in their 20s and 30s, uh, especially uh, people who've just completed uh, undergraduate or graduate degrees and want to stay here but can't because housing is so expensive. So low-income housing, affordable housing seems to be your concern, Chris. Yes, and we humbled ourselves as... Uh, students and lived in a trailer in Lyme for four years and saved so much money, but it was not. It was it was hum- a kind of a humbling place to live. Okay, but I I think it's it's one of the answers. And what do you think? Well, Chris, thank you so much. And boy, we've done countless programs on affordable housing. So go ahead, Senator Kelly. Yeah. Chris, uh, thank you so much. I am also deeply concerned, and what I think I believe you were saying is that uh, graduates from our colleges and universities, which we touched on a little bit earlier with uh, how do you afford uh, to, uh, once you graduate and you have loans and expenses and a first-time job, how do you afford housing? And it is a real issue. And as I said earlier, we need to work together, uh, public and private, on these issues uh, and to make sure that our young people are staying here and not leaving because of housing. When I spoke with uh, some students uh, recently and asked them uh, that that question and said, what ideas do you have, too, about this? Because, as I said earlier, a lot of go back home. Students are going back home to live with their parents because uh, they can't afford the housing. And said, well, if the companies that we uh, we're working for because we want to stay here. Some that had done some internships and were really invested in those companies helped us to provide housing while we paid off our student loans and while we invested so much time and energy in beginning our careers with them. That would really help to understand that they uh, would be um, agreeable to that. The so I think is, um, the communities really set housing policy. It's set, it's set, you know, by city by city, town by town. Mm-hmm. So the state has laws on the books already saying that communities cannot, um, they have to make quote unquote reasonable accommodation or right. something like that for right. affordable housing. Right. And so it sounds good on right. paper, but then the nuts and right. bolts of it, town by town, it gets right. blocked. So just two things, because I was speaking, I think Chris was talking, I hope I'm right, um, about a, co- a college student graduating. And so the idea of uh, industry and uh, uh, helping to initiate some of the housing, I think is a great idea, working together. Remember, they want the skilled and educated workforce. They have an investment to make that happen. Young people want to stay if they know there are opportunities. Housing is keeping them from doing that, the cost of housing, because of their uh, their loans. So just think what collaboration and kind of uh, uh, work we can do working together. Well, some the, businesses uh, tell us they want workforce housing. They support it. But, you know, to build it is tough because some zoning boards and planning boards say, eh, I don't mm-hmm, want that here. Mm-hmm. Too many well, people, too many kids. Right. And we do have laws. We need to make sure that that those laws are uh, enforced so that we do have workforce housing. I voted for workforce housing every time I had an opportunity in the Senate, and I would continue to support that as governor. I will just say that we really don't have a choice here. We must have our young people and have public policy that attracts our young people to stay here. We cannot depend on the past, and we cannot depend on only one generation to uh, 
to end up having a strong economy. It won't work. So we have no choice but to work together to make sure that our students can stay here and pay for housing and pay off their loans with many of the initiatives we talked about before and many, many more that we could um, put forth because as a collaborator uh, working to move things forward, I will do that with with industry, business, and healthcare as well. Okay, so speaking of collaboration, I want to ask you about guns. And this is an area, as you know, Senator Kelly, that it's hard to find common ground. Um, you say you're for common sense, quote unquote, gun reform. Mm-hmm. What does that mean exactly? Because one person's common sense might mean another's infringement on Second Amendment rights. Well, I, what I do say is it's common sense gun safety. Um, and that I have, as I said, voted for. Um, and stood up to when I was in the Senate. Uh, when Chris Anuna became governor, the first bill that he signed, one of the first bills that he signed into law was to allow gun owners uh, to carry um, a permit. Uh, I'm sorry, to carry a concealed weapon without a permit. Um, and that's just common. I would veto that in a minute. Think about that. You would bring that back. That I would bring that back. carry permit. Right, right. So that's the, the first bill um, that he actually signed into law. So I would repeal that. That's just common sense. We know the people in our communities. We know our chief of police. They know us. That's just common sense safety. Look, Laura, what's been happening across this country is terrible with the schools. It's, it's devastating. It's so sad. It's heartbreaking. Um, and... We can't allow that to happen, and I am not going to wait for that to happen here in New Hampshire. Those young people who stood up, those young students, are so courageous, and I stand with them. It is time for us to pass universal background checks. We must keep guns out of the hands of children, and we must keep guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. So how about and, raising the gun purchasing age to 21? That's an idea that some that's people an idea, have talked about. That's would another you support idea. that? That's another idea we, could, we would support. I would support. Also, um, I will just say that we, it is time to keep military-style weapons off the streets of, uh, of New Hampshire. Let me just say one more thing, especially about school safety. Two, actually, two things, if I can get them in. I have four children. When they were growing up, Laura, I never worried when they went to school that they would be affected by gun violence. I now have seven grandchildren. I worry every single day about them and their safety. We, Governor Sununu put a task force together to look at, at uh, school safety and said, but we're not, we're not going to talk about guns. Betsy DeVos, Secretary of Education under the Trump administration, did the exact same thing, exact same thing. They put a task force together to look at school safety, but said we're not going to look at guns. So a couple of your specific ideas. Um, One, you said you would support raising the gun purchase age to 21. Another, uh, you said you would return the concealed carry permit. Opponents of this permit, Senator Kelly, said that it had the potential to be abused by local authorities who might have a grudge Mm -hmm. against someone in town. Mm -hmm. How much does that potential You know, we have to balance balance things in our life, right? So I'm going to balance this by saying, I have not heard of those abuses. There always can be one or two, but I trust our uh, police chiefs in our town that know our community. And what I'm talking about is safety. We have gone too far to the other side. We are not talking about taking people's guns away. We're talking about being safe and being safe on our streets. Look, we, we are talking about our children, Laura. In many situations Well, not here. just children. There have been mass shootings at churches and shopping malls and concerts and so forth. So it's not just so schools. It's, it's children. It's people in our community. They look to us as elected officials to make sure that their communities are safe. I think it's probably the number one job of a governor is to make sure that the state is safe. And that's what I'm talking about. So talking about concealed carry, if um, more people were carrying concealed, there's always the argument that, hey, if something was going on, that person with the concealed carry Mm -hmm. gun could pull that out and stop the bad guy. Yes. And I've heard those arguments before. I would say less guns, not more. (laughs) Um, And all I'm trying to do is to make sure that we, we are safe and we move forward. We are seeing a time in history in our schools, and I know it's in other venues as well, but most of this has been happening more recently in our schools, and these are our children. When they walk into that school every day, Laura, they expect us to keep them safe. That's the direction I want to go and to make sure that they are. I'm committed to that. I will stand with those students. Well, less guns, not more, again, could be a tough um, line in a campaign in a state like New Hampshire. In, in it's lots just of common sense. Here, I mean, lots of gun owners. Your, your argument that you brought up was that if we all had guns, we'd be safer. 
That wasn't my I, argument. I was putting the argument right, forward that I, others have I put forward. I don't agree with that argument. Let's move on to the Liquor Commission, because that's been in the news, um, Senator Kelly. And if you were governor, this would be part of your administration. As you know, liquor sales in New Hampshire are a major source of income for the state. First of all, before we get into some of the current controversy, how do you feel about that arrangement, that we as a state actively promote alcohol consumption? It is part of our tax um, structure. And that's that's where we are, right? So, yes, I support I support uh, uh, taxing and having our own state liquor stores, and it is part of our um, economy. I think your question is what's been happening uh, in the liquor stores in regard to uh, um, uh, what we found out recently. There is really a possibility that there's things going on that we need to take a look at. Uh, and I think that the state has a responsibility, certainly the governor does, and I would, as governor, make sure that those transactions are all transparent. And I would be there to protect our state workers who need protection at this time with this controversy. Well, and for listeners who might not be as up on the details, um, Senator Kelly, the State Employees Association, including some members who work at the state liquor stores, are accusing the New Hampshire Liquor Commission of being complicit in potentially illegal all-cash sales to so-called bootleggers. Um, some workers say they were encouraged to turn a blind eye to high-volume purchases that might violate federal regulations. But, you know, after all, the state does benefit. So I just wonder oh, how much you think this is going on. We need, as, as, as governor, uh, when I'm governor, I would certainly look into all of those transactions, transparency, accountability, and to um, protect our state workers. A couple more quick questions for you, Senator Kelly. Um, in terms of marijuana legalization, the state Democratic Party appears poised to officially support marijuana legalization in its party platform um, meeting coming up very soon. How do you feel about this? I, uh, I support legalization, regulation, and taxing marijuana. So some people that we've talked to, we've talked about, again, done a gazillion shows on this question. And what often comes up, Senator Kelly, and I want to know what you think, some people who are deeply involved in combating the state's opioid epidemic say, look, this is the last thing we need right now. Please don't do this. Let's not encourage more drug-taking behavior at a time when we want people to stop taking drugs. So how do you feel about well, that? Well, I, I, I don't think it's a pathway uh, to opiates at all. In fact, I think um, that if we legalize and regulate as we do alcohol, um, then we have laws, uh, regarding uh, when, how, um, and also uh, we will know what is in marijuana, as we also know what is in liquor, because we are regulating it. So I think ha we actually would have more control of uh, what is happening in our state with marijuana, and it is time to legalize and to regulate, and I would agree on taxing. It is not a pathway to um, opiate. We've talked to I have you. been. Well, I've heard from people who's, who are in recovery from addiction, and they've said, Boy, I started with marijuana. The high wasn't enough, so I turned to opioids. So I, I wonder what you think. Well, I, I, I think that uh, uh, we have to look at a much bigger picture of why people are addicted to opiates um, than one particular or an incident or experience in, that you have with, with another kind of drug uh, earlier on. Um, so, look, let, let me just say about the opiate epidemic. It is an epidemic. It is a crisis in our state. It is broader than that statement. And so what I want to do is to address it as a public health issue. It is, we should treat it the same as any other medical epidemic that we have, a comprehensive plan to address prevention, treatment, and recovery. And let me say, I am grateful that our U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen and U.S. Senator Maggie Hassan have been able to move money into our state, $23 million to address this opiate crisis. Our governor has not been able to do that, even with the number of trips that he has taken to Washington um, to meet with the Trump administration to acquire funding. So we must address this issue. It is a priority. Um, and uh, people are suffering. People are dying. It is affecting every family. It's now affecting our businesses. It is a priority, and it must be a comprehensive plan. And I want to ask you about um, immigration policy, not mm -hmm. the national policy um, mm -hmm. that's happening at the Mexico border. Mm -hmm. I know you've had some comments about children being separated from their parents. But to your possible role uh, mm -hmm. as governor, mm -hmm. For the second time this year, U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents conducted an immigration checkpoint on Interstate 93. I'm sure you're aware of this, Senator mm -hmm. Kelly. This time, local police were not involved. But last year, Woodstock police mm -hmm. did participate in a checkpoint alongside Customs and Border Protection agents. 
Local police made some drug arrests. Uh, a judge later suppressed evidence of those arrests on constitutional grounds. But what about the policy regarding local or state cooperation but with Customs and Border let's, Protection? Let's, let's just start with, I do want to make a statement about that. I am sickened. About I the immigration about at, the Mexi- immig- at the Mexican border. I am border. sickened about the fact that children are being taken um, from their parents, crying children. Breaks my heart. It's unacceptable. And what I don't understand is that we had the uh, Trump Border Patrol on Route 93 in Plymouth on Father's Day uh, doing checkpoints. If governor, what, what would you do about I that? I would not be silent as our governor is. I would stand up to Donald Trump and say we do not need deportation officers here in our state uh, doing checkpoints um, here in New Hampshire, especially in a, in a town that is not even close to the border. I would stand up to Donald Trump. I am disappointed that our governor has remained silent. So would you kick the ICE agents out? Would you say you can't come in? I mean, saying you're disappointed, that's one step. But can you really do anything I, as I governor? Would, I would speak. I would speak up and I would say, we do not need, nor do we want. We are a welcoming state. Immigra- immigrants have not been de- have really enriched our communities. I'm Irish. My ancestors were all immigrants. My husband's mother uh, is an immigrant. We know that uh, this state uh, is only enriched, and we need to move forward. I would work with our uh, federal delegation as well to make sure that we have good, sound immigration policy. But I am really disappointed in what happened on Sunday. And I would stand up to Donald Trump and say, no more. We do not need deportation. I want to just clarify a point that was made earlier. Um, Your Democratic opponent, Steve Marchand, has said he is not taking the tax pledge. So I just want to clear that up. Uh, Last question for you, please, uh, Senator Kelly. Um, Understandable that you've been, you know, you're a Democratic gubernatorial candidate, so it's understandable that you would be critical of the current occupant um, of the corner office, Governor Sununu. But is there anything he's done that you think is great? You'd say, yeah, good job. I think signing the transgender bill is a good thing, and I would support that. All right. We will close it out there. I really appreciate you coming in. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank That's you. That's former State Senator Molly Kelly. Again, she is a Democratic candidate for governor this year. Democrats have a choice in the fall. There is a primary, so Molly Kelly and Steve Marchand are both running uh, as Democratic gubernatorial candidates, hoping for the opportunity to challenge Chris Sununu later in the fall. You can listen to past interviews here on The Exchange. You can always go to our website, nhpr.org exchange. You can watch our gubernatorial interviews on Facebook Live. And we hope you join us the next time. This is The Exchange on NHPR.